we just finished visiting with the newly uh, elected and appointed judges about the topic of contempt, and it was suggested that perhaps we uh, put some comments here on this record or this recording for the use of those who weren't able to be with us today. In that regard, we focused with regard to contempt of court on five fundamental questions that we needed to address before we use this extraordinary power. And the first point to make is contempt is an extraordinary power. It does involve making profound decisions that are essential to maintaining the effectiveness of trial courts. And all of us understand that there comes a time for contempt. And all of us hopefully also understand there come a number of times when we encounter difficult trying people in situations that don't require the use of contempt. And as a matter of fact, that are better left alone without the use of that authority. The questions, five in number, are first, should contempt be used at all? Sometimes a party to a case answers that question for us. If somebody claims that a personal protection order was violated, if somebody claims that a support order was violated, if somebody claims that a zoning enforcement or nuisance order was violated, that party has to file a motion with the court asking the court to take specific action that may include contempt. And that's filed under the Michigan Court Rule 3.606, and that motion for finding of contempt has to be supported by affidavit facts. Sometimes, however, contempt is instituted in essence by the court. If there's a disruptive litigant in court whose conduct ends up severely interfering with the operation of the court, whose conduct or statements significantly impair the authority of the court, then the court may be constrained to act on its own motion to see to it that that conduct is addressed in a way that restores the authority and the effectiveness of the court. So the first question is, if we have a party filing a petition for an order to show cause, supported by affidavit, relating to contempt, we have to make sure that that party has complied with the applicable court rule, which is 3.606 and the relevant statutes. On the other hand, if the judge institutes the proceedings or determines that immediate action is necessary to preserve the authority of the courts, such requirements need not be met. The second question that the judge needs to ask himself or herself is whether any contempt is direct or indirect. Direct contempt is all contempt committed in the immediate view and presence of a sitting judge. So we have to ask, does the judge have at his or her disposal all of the information pertinent to making a decision concerning whether or not the conduct was contemptuous? If the judge has all that information, and if it was obtained while the judge was sitting as a judge during court, then the court may act summarily and punish that contempt immediately. So if a spectator stands and creates a disturbance in court and interferes with the ability of the court to proceed, then the court can take immediate action which could include contempt for that conduct. The third question that we need to be willing to address and consider is whether the contempt is civil or criminal. If the contempt is civil, we judge that by the goal the court has in responding. If the court's goal is to compel or coerce compliance, then the contempt is civil. So if, let's say, a husband was ordered in a divorce to deliver a 1965 GTO to his soon-to-be former wife in a judgment of divorce entered by the court, either by settlement or trial, 
and refused to do so, the husband would be guilty of indirect contempt. That is to say, contempt committed outside the immediate view and presence of the court. We don't know, and the judge doesn't know, the circumstances surrounding the failure to comply. And upon a motion being filed, supported by affidavit on behalf of the wife, he or she, that is to say the judge, could schedule a show cause hearing to determine those circumstances based on evidence and make a determination as to the appropriate remedy, which could include the husband being jailed until such time with the keys in the husband's pocket he delivers the GTO as required by the court's judgment of divorce. Another purpose of civil contempt, instead of compelling future performance, is to reward damages for losses. If the GTO was delivered, but the husband had allegedly damaged it, the wife might end up filing a show cause petition for indirect contempt given the circumstances surrounding the judgment of divorce and the husband's alleged conduct. And now the court could make a determination of damages based on evidence after a fair hearing at a scheduled show cause proceeding and could award damages to the wife for the injury or the damage to the GTO. The other broad type of contempt is criminal contempt. We're not concerned about changing the future. We're not concerned primarily about awarding damages. Rather, we're concerned with punishing prior conduct so as to ensure the continued effectiveness of the courts. So if a witness in a criminal case called by the prosecutor refuses to testify, the judge may have occasion to coerce that testimony through a civil remedy. At the same time, if the witness testified but did so falsely or tried to influence a juror, the court then could act by way of criminal contempt to punish past misconduct rather than coerce future compliance. The type of hearing differs for civil contempt. We take a look at the rule, 3.606, and we say to ourselves, a person is entitled to have a civil hearing or trial on the question of whether or not he or she is in civil contempt. And again, that process is conducted without the benefit of a jury. That process involves soliciting and admitting evidence in accordance with the rules of evidence and a decision and opinion by the court as to whether or not there's been a failure to comply with its order and what the appropriate remedy is. The key to the civil contempt sanction as it relates to jail is that its purpose is to compel compliance. So if the person can no longer comply they can't be held in jail on condition that they do comply. With respect to criminal trial, that again is a non-jury trial. At that trial, if the defendant is indigent, he or she is entitled to be represented by appointed counsel unless it's determined that jail will not be imposed. So we can't jail someone for contempt unless they're furnished counsel if they're found to be indigent. The only possible exception is a case called Turner, a federal United States Supreme Court decision that held in child support enforcement proceedings if neither party is represented by a lawyer and if there are adequate safeguards ensuring the accuracy of the proceedings such as, for example, friend of the court auditing and accounting procedures, then the court may sentence even an indigent person to jail to enforce support without uh, requiring the assignment of counsel. The other type of 
proceeding will be summary proceedings. If we have direct contempt in the immediate view and presence of a sitting judge, he or she may act summarily. No evidence, no hearing, no trial to address the question of contempt and restore order in the court. The final question among the five that we have been discussing includes what sanction or what penalties are available. If summary proceedings for direct contempt are used, the question is what kind of remedy is adequate to restore order and the authority of the court. So the requirement is that there be a necessity that the sanction that's imposed through summary proceedings be what is necessary, what is essential, what is required to vindicate the authority of the court. And the court's job in that setting is not primarily to punish the defendant, except to the extent it may be required to restore the authority of the court. Moreover, the purpose is the court's authority as an institution, not the judge's sensitivities as a person. So it's a question of contempt of court and not a question of contempt of judge. With regard to civil contempt, that is to say the indirect contempt that is civil in nature, the sanction available is a coercive sanction, including jail, until the person found in contempt complies with a neglected order, or until he or she no longer can. Another goal, a second type of remedy in civil contempt proceedings is compensatory damages. So the court's purpose and goal is to try and financially put the person in the position they occupied before the misconduct of the individual found in contempt. Where the husband has gone out and slashed the tires on that GTO and then delivered it in damaged condition to his wife, he's complied with the requirement that the car be delivered, but he's caused damage in doing so. And as a result, he can be assessed those damages together with the wife's court cost, the wife's attorney fees, and a fine limited by the statute. With regard to criminal contempt, where we're simply punishing a past act, the easiest way to think of it is as if it were a misdemeanor offense with no right to jury trial. So we're in a setting where the court can, if there's a finding of criminal contempt beyond a reasonable doubt, at the end of a non-jury trial, find the defendant in criminal contempt, sentenced to a term of up to 93 days in jail, sentenced to a fine of up to $7,500. The court can require restitution for any losses caused to the aggrieved party by the criminal contempt and can award attorney fees, including reimbursement to the funding unit if court-appointed counsel was necessary. If one looks at the materials that you've been provided concerning the contempt of court bench guide and the statutory provisions cited there, together with the flow charts and the appendices, which include checklists, you'll have the information that's required to think about contempt in a sustained and hopefully correct way. Thank you very much. It's a little shorter, but that's all.